Today we're going to complete our series that we have been working through the summer in the book of Acts. And we are now following Paul in this section of Acts and we're going to leave the series with Paul's time in Athens. And the book of Acts, I pray and hope that this has been a hopeful and helpful series for, for you and for the church. Uh, I certainly have enjoyed going back into Acts and taking some time looking at these texts and thinking and studying them. The book of Acts is kind of like a large pool, and, and I know we've only sort of dipped our foot in it at one end and, and moved it around, but uh, hopefully the series will be an opportunity to increase our, our awareness of Acts and that as you take time to read and reflect and study on your own, that we've been able to open some doors and some windows in your own personal devotion. Before we read Paul's encounter in Athens, I've chosen this text from, from the 40th, 40th chapter of Isaiah. And Paul in, in Athens is proclaiming the word. He is a messenger. And uh, it seemed like this text from Isaiah had some, some bearing on what we'll read in Acts. So from the book of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 40, beginning with verse 6. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. And from the book of Acts in the 17th chapter, we remember that we left Paul in Philippi. And there we met Lydia, first convert around which Paul brought that church together. And also we met the Philippian jailer. And then, you know, Paul went off to Berea and Thessalonica and got into trouble, as he was wont to do, for proclaiming the gospel. And uh, so he left and got in a little boat and went over to Athens. And he was there by himself for a little bit and uh, until Silas and the others could come and meet him. And this is what happened to Paul while he was in Athens well, Paul was waiting for them in Athens. He was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. And then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since 
He himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius, Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Athens was and is a beautiful city. And, uh, and one of the great joys that I have had in, in ministry is to go to Athens and to be at this very place that this text describes and points out for us, the Areopagus, Mars Hill. And while the commentators, they debate amongst themselves whether it was at Mars Hill near the Acropolis or somewhere in the colonnades, you know, uh, in Athens, the, the Athenians have made a plaque at, at the rock formation, the Areopagus, with Paul's sermon in the Greek. So if the Athenians think it happened there, that's good enough for me, you know. And uh, it's a rock formation, and it stands at the foot, sort of, at the Acropolis and Parthenon. And, and um, from that vantage point, as Paul preached you can imagine this massive Greek temple in the background. And not only that temple, all over the city is filled with shrines and statues and, and places of worship with, with gods and goddesses from all over. One person back then said, it is easier in Athens to find a god than a man. I mean, everywhere you went, you were just, oh, there's another god. Ah, oh, there's another goddess. There's a temple to, ah, you know. The city made an impression on Paul as he was walking around Athens, looking at all this. We find him, of course, in the marketplace, preaching about Jesus, in the synagogue, arguing with the Jews about Jesus and proclaiming the gospel. In particular, Luke points out that the message that he was proclaiming was the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of Jesus. For as Paul looked around the city of Athens, as beautiful as it was, filled with so much magnificent statuary and architecture and, and all that made it so beautiful, Paul found himself becoming increasingly distressed and provoked about what he saw. Because he saw that the Athenians had a great, a great sense of worship. 
But the truth was that they worshiped everything, but in reality, they were worshiping nothing. And the beautiful city, perhaps in Paul's eyes, because he stressed the resurrection, he saw it as like a beautiful cemetery. Pretty to see, but dead in his heart. While the city made an impression on Paul, Paul also made an impression on the city. And uh, he was in the marketplace, and someone said, what is this babbler saying? Which is a pejorative term to say someone who just kind of peddles and scraps and bits of knowledge. You know, he's just... He's just uh, he thinks he's something, but, you know, we don't need to listen. But, you know, the Stoics and the Epicureans, they, you know, this is something new. It's different, you know. It's, they got curious about him. And, uh, and so they got curious about Paul, and, and since it was so new, and that's what Luke says, the Athenians, they just love to debate about something new, you know, something new. They decided to uh, receive him officially. And so they took him to the Areopagus and said, all right, tell us what you got. You know, Paul's dilemma, I mean, there's no church in Athens. I mean, he's in new ground. You know, and his dilemma, as he speaks to this very august body who was sort of the official arbiters of, uh, of uh, discussion and philosophy and truth in, in Athens, the Areopagus. Now, what's his dilemma? How do you relate the gospel of Jesus Christ to a culture that hasn't heard it? How do you do it? And so we read his sermon, and I'm sure there was a lot more to it than this, but uh, we see his thrust. And he, he sees that he points where they are, your religious people. But, you know, you got all this stuff, and let me tell you about the real God. And so Paul really kind of uses imagery from the Old Testament, even bringing up Adam without naming him. So all these gods that you have, it's all stones and sticks and wood and sculpture. And what you need is a God who is alive, who is a living God. And not only, not only do I introduce to you a God who has created all things and holds all things and, and uh, watches over all things, but this God has revealed his face in the flesh in one man. And the power that we receive in this one man, and he'd already been speaking about Jesus in the marketplace is that he was raised from the dead. And that's the message that Athens needed to hear. They needed to come alive. Well, Paul's dilemma is the dilemma of the church in, in every age, isn't it? The church in every age has to come to terms with the culture that it faces. And look at the culture and, and say to ourselves, how is it that we in our time, in our place, how are we going to relate the gospel of Jesus Christ into the world in which we live? And it's happening all over the world today as Christians are gathering in many different cultures, in many different places where people, you know, do things differently and see things differently. And our brothers and sisters today all over the world are grappling with that same question. How do I present the gospel in the culture today which God has placed me? Now, our society and our culture, it seems to me, may have some parallels to Athens, the Athens that Paul met. Our culture has dropped the pretense of worshiping a bunch of gods, we don't have that in our culture. We don't have a bunch of temples and statues that people worship. 
We've sort of dropped that pretense. But isn't it true that our culture, like Athens, that it seems that we spend our time in nothing except seeking the new thing? We spend our time in our culture seeking for something new. And everything that's old, you know, is, is just no good anymore, you know. We have to have what's next and, and what's best and, and what's new. And, you know, I mean, one of the things that's happened in our culture is last 15 years or so is, you know, who's the new American idol, you know. But I think that show is even passe now, isn't it? And if we stressed our brain and stretched it a little bit, we might remember one or two of the idols that have been chosen with such fanfare in the last 15 years. But, you know, the old ones, ah, it's the old. What's the next? What's new? But it's just indicative of our culture. Our culture just sort of celebrates something new. That's what we want. We don't pay attention to anything very long which perhaps indicates to me that our culture is just sort of perpetually bored. We're bored. Therefore, we must have entertainment. (laughs) We have to be entertained. We live in a world of snippets and sound bites. And uh, if it doesn't catch our fancy, eh, No good. We don't have to save anything anymore, you know, because it's all stored for us on a cloud somewhere. I don't know where this cloud is, but I'll tell you, it must be pretty big. It can store a lot of stuff. And eternal life in our culture, perhaps the culture thinks, well, you know, we live eternally somehow in the cloud. Unless we have a YouTube that goes viral, you know, and we can kind of live perpetually in that. In our culture, we don't have sort of a panoply of temples and gods and statues and things like that. But, you know, isn't our technology kind of like that? I mean, how long can we be separated from our technology? In our culture, we no longer look to the past to find meaning. I mean, anything in the past, you know, they didn't know anything. I mean, they didn't know what was really happening. They didn't know what was really true. I mean, anything maybe within the last 40 years, but anything beyond that, we don't care about what they thought. They didn't know anything. They are just all too flawed to tell us anything. Instead, we, we are perpetually in our culture, it seems, looking for the new thought if we're not too busy nursing our grievances. Our culture doesn't talk about developing character. We don't develop character. We just reinvent ourselves. And I could go on, you know, talking about our culture. And as Christians, we speak to this world, realizing that we have probably been influenced more by the culture than we have influenced it. Some people talk about our culture as being post-Christian. The sense that, you know, the idea of Christendom is no longer, no longer part of our world anymore. We live in a post-Christian, which sounds just kind of depressing. And I thought about that. But instead, perhaps we could view the culture in a way as pre-Christian. You know, which shows the opportunity before us as the church in our day, in our time. And we're kind of like Paul in Athens in a way. We're breaking new ground in our culture every single day as we seek to live and love and share and 
be the Christian men and Christian women that God has called us to be. Everywhere we go in our culture, as faithful Christians, we are breaking new ground with new people who may never even have heard of the gospel before, know nothing about Jesus, were raised in church, know nothing about it. It's an exciting time in a way in which we live, that we are now once again as a church in our culture on a cutting edge of what God will do in our day and our time. Kind of like Paul breaking new territory in our world. And so perhaps then it's important as Christians in a world that uh, changes us and bombards us with so much stuff to continue to hold dear some very core principles and truths that we share as Christians. That Jesus Christ has come. That Jesus Christ has died for us. That Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, He continues to come to touch the hearts and souls and lives of people, to bring new life, life abundant, life eternal. He comes because God loves the world and sent his only son. In this And in these truths, we live and move and have our being. In a culture that seems to me to be fracturing and segregating itself from others, often with deep hostility, apprehension, mistrust, the Christian communities become the visible demonstration in our world of God's heart and how God is calling people to come together. For the truth that we have is not just tied to our times, but the truth that binds us together in Christ is eternal truth that transcends our time and all time. And as we seek to live out our calling as Christians in our day, we seek to cultivate the fruits of the Spirit that animate us, that we are the people who forgive. We are the people who show kindness. We are the people who show generosity. We are the people who show patience, self-control. We are the people who come together sometimes with great differences from many different places and many different backgrounds to seek to have God mold us together as one people, not only for this time, but for all times, not only for this culture, for all cultures. The Christian church, the church of Jesus Christ, is that which rises from the rubble of every culture to go on and proclaim until the very end when that righteous one will come to judge, to proclaim in every age the truth of God and Jesus Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. Now Paul's Paul wasn't really impressive in Athens. As we see, there was a man named Dionysius, an Areopagite, you know, one of this select group of people who judged on truth and philosophy. He came to believe. And a woman named Damaris, she came to believe. And a few others who aren't named. 
But imagine in a way as we think about this text, as we enter into it, it may be that here with Dionysius the Areopagite and Damaris, we can sort of find ourselves because we're kind of like them in a way. Now think about what it was for them. All of a sudden that day, I believe in Jesus Christ. And what did they have to do? They had to build a church. And that's what they started to do. Eusebius, the church historian, says that this Dionysius became the first bishop of the church at Athens. God has building, been building this church for 40 years. And we have a beautiful and faithful past as God has brought people together to form and comprise the life of this congregation. And as we look ahead into the future days in the next 40 years, we can rejoice and give thanks for how God will continue to use this family of faith to be, as Jesus said, shining light city on a hill, the salt of the earth. So in Jesus' name, as we gather around his table today, we find ourselves touched once again in the power of the Spirit with his life. Let us go forward from this time into our city and share the power, the resurrection from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen.